as I go through, please, please feel free to send messages in the chat. Um, you know, hopefully one day we will start doing these in person again. But um, I had sort of designed this as to try to be quasi interactive as possible. Um, so, okay. So I think, um, you know, I, I do recognize that outside of uh, the cardiology realm, sometimes cardiac emergencies can be uh, very nerve wracking. So um, I think if, if somebody got a message like this, uh, they may start having chest pain themselves. So a nurse calls you and says, doc, the patient in room 403 is having chest pain. His heart rate's 102 beats per minute. His blood pressure is 92 over 63 and his O2 sat is 93%. What would you like to do next? And so, you know, it's it's messages like this that can be nerve wracking, but I hope by the end of this lecture, uh, we'll go over some um, approaches to the initial management for patients um, for the following categories. STEMI, complete heart block, ventricular tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia, cardiac tamponade, and cardiogenic shock. So whenever you're gonna approach any patient that's having some type of cardiac emergency, know what your toolkit is and know what you need to make the diagnosis. And fortunately, this is relatively simple. And uh, we also are very lucky that we have um, easy access to these things at our different campuses. So what you need is an EKG, a chest X-ray, an echocardiogram, and blood work. And when we talk about blood work, it's typically talking about getting blood counts, metabolic panel, magnesium, calcium, troponin. And oftentimes it's helpful to get up ABG and the lactate. So let's start first with STEMI. So our first case is a 65 year old man with a history of coronary artery disease, uh, has had a left circumflex PCI in the past who is now post-op after spinal surgery. The nurse notifies you that he starts complaining of substernal chest pain. So what do you do next? <clears throat> you get an EKG. And if you were all together, I try to ask you to shout out what you see here, but um, I tried to pick one that's relatively obvious, but this is an EKG of an ST elevation MI and you can see ST elevations here in lead one, in lead AVL. And then when you're looking out here in the lateral leads, these ST segments also do not look normal. And what also gives you a clue here, is you actually are seeing ST depressions here in the inferior leads, two, three, and AVF. And actually there's some depressions here in B1 through B3. So when you have ST elevations and then these reciprocal ST depressions this is a slam dunk diagnosis for an ST elevation MI. And the thing that I wanna impress upon everybody here is that when we see this kind of EKG, um, time is of the essence. And when I was a fellow, my attendings used to say to me, time is muscle. And this is why we have in the emergency department, uh, for instance, door to balloon times, because the longer that that blood vessel is occluded, the larger the infarct is gonna be and you guys are very well acquainted to this because it's very similar uh, pathophysiology in the brain. So how do you manage a STEMI? So number one, most hospitals, especially hospitals with uh, cath labs, um, have access to a STEMI team. Uh, for those of you that are at Sloan Kettering, um, actually we can be your STEMI team here at Cornell. Um, and so that is actually activated through the transfer center uh, if you're at Sloan Kettering, or if you're at any hospital for that, for that matter that doesn't have a cath lab. You wanna place your patient on telemetry, put uh, supplemental oxygen on them, and uh, initially give aspirin. Typically we do four chewables. And the thing, that, the caveat here is that neurology and neurosurgical patients um, oftentimes will have some form of contraindication to receiving antiplatelet agents or anticoagulants. So it's really important that when you are contacting the cardiology team, that we know uh, the patient's history and know what type of agents they can receive. 
Uh, when we do take patients to the cath lab, um, you may or may not realize that we actually need to systemically anticoagulate patients during left heart cath procedures because when you're in the arterial system, um, the, the catheters can clot when, if they're trying to be delivering stents. So um, we usually use either uh, heparin or we use uh, something called bivalutin. So this does full systemic anticoagulation. You want to draw labs, blood counts, chemistries, troponin, and coags. And you do not want to push intravenous beta blockers. So the reason for this is typically in the setting of a MI, you actually will have tachycardia. Um, and that's because if a big portion of the heart um, is dysfunctional, the heart is going to try to compensate and maintain cardiac output. And so the big um, risk with pushing IV beta blockers is you take away that heart rate and you're going to decrease cardiac output as a result of that. Remember, cardiac output is heart rate multiplied by stroke volume. And so actually, um, this was, this actually used to be part of the guidelines many decades ago, but has been removed because um, of the risks of either um, inducing cardiogenic shock or causing complete heart block, especially in those patients with RCA. So we take our patient to the cath lab and we find that he has a 100% proximal left circumflex in stent thrombosis, and he undergoes a balloon angioplasty and a drug eluding stent placement. And so, um, you know, this is not an uncommon scenario that we see because oftentimes if patients are undergoing a surgical procedure, um, here a neurosurgical procedure, they are often taken off their antiplatelet agents ahead of time. And so those patients are at risk for developing instant thrombosis. The risk is the highest while the stent is um, still uh, quite early in its post-stent uh, placement course. So the highest risk of instant thrombosis is going to actually be within the first 30 days. Uh, and then the risk of stent thrombosis does go down significantly after six months, but have to tell you that we do still see it even years after stents are placed. So what are some of the clinical pearls when you're dealing with STEMI? You wanna always investigate patients having chest pain um, by using an EKG. It's really important for everybody in medicine to be able to recognize ST changes. Let the clinical history guide you. So if it's a patient that has known coronary disease, has stent, has lots of risk factors for coronary disease, and they're having anginal pain that's associated with things like shortness of breath or nausea, diaphoresis, things about STEMI. When the EKG is equivocal, an echocardiogram can actually be really helpful because if you see a regional wall motion abnormality, for instance, you see that just the anterior wall is hypokinetic, and you knew that patient had a normal echo in the past, that still makes you concerned for an acute coronary syndrome. <clears throat> Remember that troponin does not rise immediately. So a negative troponin in the early stages of ACS does not exclude a diagnosis of STEMI. Now with our high sensitivity troponin, you still may not see high levels of troponin, but we are going to see this earlier on, but for instance, this post-op patient that wasn't at home that's still in our hospital, you may not see that troponin rise still for a couple hours. And then there's no expectation that neurologists or neurology PAs um, are gonna be managing STEMIs by themselves. So this should always be done in conjunction with a cardiologist. Um, questions? Anybody in the chat about STEMI? If you think of some, please just send some messages uh, as I go along here. Okay, so the next, top next topic I wanted to talk about was complete heart block. So next case, we have an 81-year-old woman with a history of wild-type TTR cardiac amyloidosis. <coughs> Excuse me who is admitted with TIA symptoms and develops bradycardia. The nurse reports that the heart rate is 30 beats per minute and the blood pressure is 90 over 75. Patient is awake 
but seems confused. What do you do next? So here we obtain EKG. Yeah. And what we can see here is this is an EKG that is showing us complete heart block. And I'll show how you know this. So one is we're going to start to look for the P waves. And the best place to do this usually is in the rhythm strip. Um, and lead two is a great place to look for P waves because they tend to be um, more easy to see and they're, all, they're usually upright when it's a sinus rhythm. So we can see P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave. But as you can see here, not every P wave has a QRS coming after it. So you already get the sense that some type of block is happening. And how do you know that it's complete heart block? Well, these P waves are completely dissociated from the ventricular rate. And another trick is you can take a look and see how this, if the PR interval is similar before the ones that are before a QRS, and you can see that the PR interval is different as well. So you have regularized P waves, which is sinus rhythm in the atria, and then you have a regularized ventricular rhythm, which is actually a ventricular escape rhythm here. So this is sinus rhythm with complete heart block. And here again, this is just accentuating where the P waves are. So what causes heart block? Sometimes it's idiopathic. This tends to happen as patients get older, that you can get fibrosis of the conduction tissue in the heart. Ischemic heart disease. So um, some of the uh, coronary lesions that may be um, supply, giving blood supply to the AV node. So more particularly, we see this with right coronary artery um, Acute coronary syndromes may cause heart block. Uh, big offender is medications, so specifically the AV node blocking agents and the antiarrhythmics, um, the topolol, the calcium channel blockers like deltiazem, verapamil, digoxin, amiodarone, all of these medications can cause heart block. Diseases that are infiltrating into the myocardium and the ones that are uh, most common are amyloidosis and sarcoidosis. Cardiac tumors, whether they're primary or metastatic. Infections, so here in the Northeast of the uh, region of the United States, we uh, not uncommonly see Lyme disease and this can lead to heart block. Endocarditis, um, particularly uh, those involving the aortic valve uh, because the AV node actually lives very close. So if you get actually an aortic root abscess, um, in conjunction with aortic valve endocarditis, this could lead to heart block. And then myocarditis can lead to heart block as well because you have all of this infiltration of inflammatory cells into the myocardium. Um, inflammatory uh, diseases, so uh, you know, myocarditis that's coming from autoimmune disorders. Uh, we had couple patients with immune checkpoint myocarditis just last week in the CCU that had, uh, I think one of them had come over from Sloan Kettering actually. So uh, these certain drugs can also lead to myocarditis. Um, when we do certain types of cardiac procedures in particular valve procedures, again, anatomically, the conducting system runs in between, in the septum, in between the valve. So when patients are getting aortic or mitral valve surgery or having a tab replaced, for instance, it's not uncommon. And then also trauma, um, like uh, trauma to the chest can also cause heart block. So how do you manage it? So first thing you should do is uh, get the pacing pads from one of the Zoll monitors, place the pads in the patient, place the patient on continuous telemetry. You wanna make sure that you have IV access. And then you have to figure out, do you need transvenous pacing? And this decision is usually made based on the hemodynamic stability of the patient and what the patient's escape rhythm looks like. You wanna look for ischemia on your EKG. Again, look for those ST elevations or ST depressions, and again, consult cardiology. Is there anything else that you could do before the TVP is placed? So you can think of two different medications that may help improve heart rate. 
One is atropine. So typically this is given as a intravenous bolus of 0 0.5 milligrams. And you can repeat this every three to five minutes for a total maximum of three milligrams. Uh, another option is to use something like dopamine. And you could use this infusion, uh, usually start at two mics per kg per minute. That could be increased up to 10 mics per kg per minute. Uh, and something that I didn't list here, uh, which is probably uncommonly used outside of um, the cardiac floors is isoproteranol, which is a beta agonist actually. Um, so that's, that's something else that can increase heart rate. Then we talk about transcutaneous pacing. This is where you're placing the pacing pads on the patient. And then on the Zoll monitor here, so typically when we're thinking about defibrillating patients during cardiac arrest, we actually turn this knob to on over here. And when we wanna do pacing, we actually put the knob to the pacer mode. <clears throat> and then these two knobs below here allow you to put the heart rate that you would like to pace the patient at and the energy or the milliamps that you're going to be delivering with each pacing beat. And those numbers will come up here on the monitor. So typically you're gonna set it to um, somewhere between 40 and 60 beats per minute. It's rare that you need to pace people faster than that. Um, <clears throat> and then you essentially, you keep increasing the output until you have capture. And how do you know that you have capture? You will see after a pacing spike, you will see a QRS complex. Um, I'm just going to let you know that if you have never seen transcutaneous pacing in a live person, um, it is not comfortable for the patient. As you can imagine, you're actually delivering enough energy to capture the heart through the chest wall. Um, and so also the bigger the patient, one, it may be very difficult to actually achieve capture, and two, you typically have to use a lot of energy, and it is not um, comfortable. So this is really only to be used in emergent type of situations. It's not something that is safe to be used long-term because you could lose capture, and, and the patient in an awake patient, it is uh, very difficult for them to tolerate it. But uh, the other option then is to do transvenous pacing. And when do we use this? So if patients are hemodynamically unstable, they're in shock, have hypotension, those that have had episodes of syncope, um, <clears throat> those with altered mental status, um, those with an unstable ventricular escape uh, rhythm, and those that have end organ, uh, signs of end organ dysfunction. So what do, you, what do I mean by unstable escape rhythm? So if we go back to our patient's EKG. The way that you decide this is you're gonna look at one, the rate of the ventricular escape. So if you have a ventricular escape that's somewhere in like the 40 to 60 beat per minute range, oftentimes you're not gonna need a transvenous pacer. But if you have uh, an escape rhythm that's only between 20 and 30 beats per minute, that usually will require transvenous pacing. And then in addition, the, Q, the width of the QRS complex. The narrower the escape rhythm, the, the more reliable it is. The wider that the QRS is, the less reliable. Um, there's a question in the chat that says, is there a clinical scenario where isoproteranol would be preferred to atropine dopamine? Is it a fast onset of action? So, <clears throat> In general, you know, when I think of isoproteranol, we actually typically use it to increase patients' heart rates when they are having uh, polymorphic VT, usually due to bradycardia. Um, so uh, it is extremely fast acting. So, and it's a short, uh, it has a short half-life. So it's uh, very much a turning on, turning off type of drug, but it's something where I'm gonna need to um, have patients' heart rates high for a longer period of time. So in general, and it's not my go-to for somebody that's in complete heart block, I usually will reach for atropine dopamine first. Um, and I tend to use the isoproteranol for that bradycardia-induced polymorphic VT. Okay.
Here we go. All right, so TVP basics. Um, it seems very daunting to have the TVP box out, but it's actually pretty simple to use. It has three knobs and, uh, you know, the, they all might look slightly different, but they all have usually these three dials. The dial on the top is the heart rate. So this is just how fast do you want your heart's, your patient's heart to beat. And you're putting, you're programming in the beats per minute. Number two is the output. So this is the energy that's required to actually, uh, that actually is delivered through the pacing wire. And we're going to use the minimum amount of energy to capture the heart. And then the last dial is the sensitivity. And so this is the minimal uh, myocardial voltage that's required for the TVP electrode to detect intrinsic electrical activity. And why is this important? So for instance, oftentimes we will set the TVP to be at a backup rate. And so if our patient has a heart rate of 80, and you've set your TVP to be at a heart rate of 50, what you want the TVP to do is to actually sense the native QRS complexes. And if it senses a native QRS complex, then what happens is the TVP will inhibit itself, meaning it will not deliver a pacing spike. Um, and so uh, some patients' QRS complexes are lower in amplitude. So you really, you can change the sensitivity. You don't want to make it too sensitive. So meaning that any little P wave or T wave inhibits the TBP, but you don't want to make it too sensitive that then um, it's, not, it's not pacing at all. So why not use transvenous pacing for everyone with heart block? Well, TVPs are invasive and they can cause complications. Um, in terms of the complications, so there is mechanically, you can actually have lead dislodgement or disconnection or cause extra cardiac stimulation. So some patients actually, they'll start hiccuping or feel this like rhythmic beating. You're actually capturing their diaphragm in addition to their heart. Um, in terms of the cardiac issues, because we are sticking a catheter into the heart, TVPs tend to have a blunt end. Um, you can cause myocardial perforation and tamponade. In addition, because there is a catheter in the heart, sometimes you can also induce VT or VF. In terms of pulmonary things, uh, this is going into the venous side of the heart. So if there was a clot in the right side of the heart or a clot in the IJ, that you insert the catheter, obviously this could get propagated and go into the lungs and cause a pulmonary embolism. When you're inserting the catheter, you could by accident induce an air embolism. And um, just the risk of any time we're placing IJ catheters, um, there's always risk of pneumothorax. And then for those patients that have TVPs in for a longer period of time, obviously this is a central line and that line could get infected ultimately um, if it's not cared for properly. Any questions about heart block? I will keep going. Next topic is gonna to be ventricular tachycardia. So our next case is a 72-year-old man with hypertension, type 2 diabetes, he's an active 30-pack year smoker, has ischemic cardiomyopathy with a ejection fraction of 30%, and he's admitted with a right MCA stroke. The nurse calls you emergently to the bedside as the patient is unresponsive. You look up at the telemetry monitor and see a wide complex tachycardia. What do you do next? So, in this case, I hope your brain goes to start ACLS, check for a pulse and start ACLS. Um, but you know, if you're getting an EKG or just looking up at the telemetry monitor, if you see a rhythm that looks like this, this is ventricular tachycardia. So how do you differentiate VT from an SVT or supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy? And if you read any cardiology textbook, they will say that the hallmark of VT is atrioventricular dissociation. So what does that mean? It means that the P waves that are, that are seen 
on the EKG are not in conjunction with the ventricular activity. So kind of think about complete heart block. It's the same thing. What's happening in the atria has nothing to do with what's happening in the ventricle. And sometimes what happens is that that beat from the atrium actually conducts down into the ventricle and you might get what's called these fusion beats, which the QRS complex looks slightly different. But my motto always is keep it simple, stupid. So when you see wide complex tachycardia, just assume it's VT. Is the patient hemodynamically unstable? The answer to that is yes. Go ahead and proceed with unsynchronized defibrillation. Put the pads on the patient, set it to the shock function, charge your defibrillator, and, let, and release that charge. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, meaning they're awake, they're talking to you, you can measure blood pressure, you actually can start thinking about um, some other um, interventions. Now, in terms of non-pharmacologic, oh, here we go. Sorry, I'm not sure why that came like that. So in terms of medications, uh, think about using amiodarone, lidocaine, magnesium, and procainamide. And when we're talking about amiodarone, you, depending um, on what the situation is, you're going to load the patient with amiodarone, typically at least 150 milligrams IV. In a code situation, we usually give 300. In terms of non-pharmacologic interventions that we use in VT storm, um, remember that catechols help to drive VT. So oftentimes what we need to do is actually intubate the patient and give them sedation. Um, for those, VT is very much linked with ischemia. So whenever you see VT, think that the patient is having an acute coronary syndrome. So usually we will take those types of patients for a left heart cath. And finally, um, oftentimes we place balloon pumps for these patients because you are decreasing the pressure inside the heart because high pressures inside the heart also can drive the arrhythmia. Again, these sorts of things, left heart casts, balloon pumps are gonna be done in conjunction with cardiology. So next case, we have a 52 year old man who's admitted with seizures and is being treated with phenytoin he suddenly develops wide complex tachycardia. We look up at the monitor and you see this. So this is a picture of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is different than what we saw before. So just to compare and contrast, this is monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. And we know that because when we look in this rhythm strip, all the QRS complexes here are look the similar, about the same width, they're all being, um, in the same axis, meaning like they're all pointing down, as opposed to this rhythm where you see the QRS complexes all look different. The axis here actually is changing. And this is also the other name for this rhythm is tor torsade de point. And the reason for that is that's the French term for twisting points. And this is, you know, you see this kind of undulating uh, type of rhythm. This telemetry strip actually you see here the patient gets defibrillated and we see at least some type of restoration of more normal rhythm. So how do you treat polymorphic VT? Again, if the patient's hemodynamically unstable, proceed with unsynchronized defibrillation. The key electrolyte here typically is magnesium. So you're gonna load people with IV magnesium. You can go ahead and give them two grams up front a few minutes later, you can give them another two grams. And this is uh, in when we were talking about the uh, isoproteranol earlier in the discussion. This is the situation where I use this drug. And the reason for this is what can happen is that when patients are bradycardic, they can get what's called R on T phenomena. What is that? So what that means is that a PVC actually lands on the T wave. And this is more commonly can occur if patients are having frequent PVCs and that they're bradycardic because what happens is the QT interval is just longer when patients are bradycardic. There are also patients who have underlying QT syndromes 
this is usually a genetic defect or a genetic mutation that leads to this. But know that sometimes actually people with long QT syndrome, their baseline ECG may be in the normal range, but then certain drugs may unmask their long QT. And those things um, that are commonly associated with this are antibiotics like the fluoroquinolones, and then many of the anti-epileptic agents and the antipsychotic agents. So those are the big three drug categories that we worry about causing QT, QT prolongation. So if your patient's on a QT prolonging drug, they develop polymorphic VT, we need to stop that drug. And then you think about increasing the heart rate either with isoproteranol, which is an intravenous infusion, or sometimes we actually place a TVP and we do what's called overdrive pacing, meaning that we pace the patient faster than their native heart rate. And this is the one situation that sometimes we do pace patients as fast as like 90 beats per minute. And this helps us suppress the VT. Um, we should also evaluate for myocardial ischemia. Polymorphic VT can be indicative of that. And again, I already mentioned the QT prolonging agents. Questions about polymorphic VT or long QT? Okay, next topic is gonna to be supraventricular tachycardia. So our next case is a 78 year old man with a history of hypertension, type two diabetes, who's being admitted with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. A nurse calls you that the patient's heart rate is 168 beats per minute. His blood pressure is 108 over 68. He is awake and mentating, but complaining of palpitations. So what do you do next? We're all together at this point. I hope you guys would yell out EKG. So you get an EKG and what does this show? So this, if you wanna describe it in a general sense, looks like a narrow complex tachycardia. Narrow complex referring to the QRS complex and we can see that this is quite narrow. Think about the VT EKGs that we just saw. Um, and again, this all looks like the, each of the beats are very similar. And the other thing to point out here is that this looks very regular. So again, first question to yourself should be, is the patient hemodynamically unstable? In general, most people can tolerate being in an SVT, but if your underlying heart function is poor, so say you have an ejection fraction of 10% to begin with, Sometimes going into, into an SVT will cause you to be hemodynamically unstable. So if this happens, then you're going to proceed with synchronized defibrillation. So I just wanna make a pause here, make a point. In all the other situations I've discussed up until now, I had mentioned unsynchronized defibrillation. When patients are in ventricular tachycardia or polymorphic VT, it doesn't matter at what point in time you defibrillate them. But if you have a patient in an SVT, especially a regular SVT, you actually can program the ZOL monitor to do synchronized defibrillation. So what it will do is the ZOL will start tracking the patient's rhythm and it's going to defibrillate at the right time. And this helps to avoid having that R on T phenomenon that I mentioned earlier, because if you do unsynchronized defibrillation, you run this small risk actually you can convert the patient into VT or VF. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, take a deep breath. You have time to think and make a diagnosis. Put your patient on telemetry, make sure you have IV access. And actually the first thing you can try is to do a vagal maneuver. How do you do that? So you could do carotid massage if you knew that that was safe in your patient. Or you can just ask the patient to do a Valsalva type of maneuver. So either you can have them pull their arms apart really tight, tell them to bear down, and sometimes that can help to break the arrhythmia. Pharmacologically, usually we use adenosine. When we do adenosine, you wanna make sure that you have the patient on a 12 lead EKG. You're going to actually switch it to rhythm mode. So that's when the paper is just going through and you see a continuous EKG and you're gonna do a rapid push of six milligrams of IV adenosine. 
And you must chase this with a saline push because if it's just sitting in the IV line, it doesn't really help. So typically I have, um, I put a three-way stopcock on the patient's IV. I have the adenosine loaded on one stopcock. I have the saline flush on the other. You push the adenosine, turn the stopcock, push the saline. And you're going to mark on the rhythm strip when that was being pushed. Now, I usually forewarn the patient, you're gonna feel hot, warm, flush feeling. Most of, if it's going to work, you're going to see the heart rate slow down. Sometimes there is a few moments of asystole. It feels like forever, but um, it's, it just, uh, it, it'll come back. And this is a way for us to diagnose what the underlying rhythm is. And so for many patients actually will break the arrhythmia and that's diagnostic in itself. But sometimes if you have actually a rhythm like atrial flutter or an atrial tachycardia, what will happen is that you will essentially, um, adenosine is an AV nodal blocking agent. And so what it will do is you'll essentially induce heart block and you'll just get to see what the underlying atrial rhythm is. When you think about SVT, this is the algorithm I think to myself. I first look and say, is it a regular tachycardia or an irregular tachycardia? And then I look and see, is it a narrow QRS versus a wide QRS? And when you have this construct in your brain, then you can sort of figure out which, what is gonna be your differential diagnosis for that specific patient. So once you have the diagnosis, then you can turn to medical therapies. And the things that we have uh, in our toolbox are beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, digoxin, and rhodorone. And there's other more specific, uh, more specialized antiarrhythmic therapies, things like dofetilide or sotalol. Those types of drugs really are, can only be prescribed by a cardiologist. And then the other thing you have to think about is whether or not your patient needs anticoagulation for thromboembolic um, prevention. In terms of the procedural therapies, we can think about doing a cardioversion or an ablation. I do wanna mention Wolf Parkinson White. So this is actually um, a bypass tract that a patient is born with. So normally all of the uh, electrical conduction goes through the Hisperkinji system. So those are those electrical highways that are going through your heart. Some patients are born with what's called a bypass tract. And what happens is that the electrical activity can actually go down one, through one of the walls of the heart and it can activate the, vent, the ventricle that way as opposed to going through the AV node where there will be a delay between the atrium and the ventricle. In general, this is not dangerous, except the one dangerous time is that patients, if they go into atrial fibrillation, then they can have very, very rapid conduction uh, through the bypass tract to the ventricles. And, you know, why do you need to think about this? So here, what we see is an irregular Y-complex tachycardia. And this is actually a patient who has atrial fibrillation and wolf parkinson white And the reason that you need to recognize this is because this is one of the few times that you should not push adenosine. Because if you block every, all, everything going through the AV node, you will actually push all the electrical activity through the bypass tract, and those types of patients can have cardiac arrest. Um, so here is a cartoon of the anatomy. So normally, uh, here is our SA node, our sinus node. Normally, our electrical activity is going to go down through the AV node and then through the right bundle and the left bundles. <clears throat> but here, what happens is that there is a bypass tract out here in the lateral wall of the left ventricle. And what can happen is that the ventricular active, electro, electrical activity can retrograde, come up through that bypass tract and then go back down. And so you can get what's called a re-entrant tachycardia. But the concern is that if a patient goes into atrial fibrillation and you block the AV node with that adenosine, you actually push all of that conduction down through the bypass tract, and that's when you can get that one-to-one -one connection. And so here, the answer, like on a board, for instance, would be that those patients need to get cardioversion or procalamide, and we shouldn't use any of the other agents that I mentioned.
The other way to diagnose Wolf Parkinson White on a resting ECG when they're not in atrial arrhythmia is this delta wave. And this is a short PR interval. And we get this pre-excitation because some of the activity is actually getting pre-excited through getting down to the ventricle uh, more quickly. And so you get this wider QRS with this characteristic upsloping portion of the QRS confidence. Questions about SVTs? All right, we keep on moving here to tamponade. So our next case is a 62-year-old woman with a history of metastatic melanoma with METs to the brain and heart who was admitted to the neuro ICU after a seizure. The nurse informs you the patient's becoming tachycardic and hypotensive, and vo volume resuscitation has started without significant response. We examine the patient and note that she is tachypnic, mildly hypoxic, and has distended neck veins. The chest x-ray shows an enlarged cardiac silhouette and an EKG is performed. And what the main finding here that I wanted to point out to you guys is that this EKG shows very low voltage. So in general, in the Lynn reads, you should have QRS complexes that are at least five little boxes in height. And out here in the precordial leads, there should be at least 10 little boxes in height. Um, okay, we have a question. I'm gonna go back to this question here. Uh, we had a patient with AVNRT and kept going into SVT at night requiring adenosine. What medication should we avoid in a patient like this? Um, I think here, I'm not sure if there's anything that, you know, in terms of medication, that gives you only things you worry about is if there's anything that is stimulating this type of arrhythmia. So for instance, if the patient is on pressors like norepinephrine, epinephrine, those types of medications, dibutamine can sometimes elicit um, more of the SVTs. Otherwise, um, let me uh, clarify the question a little bit more. Um, you may wanna put this patient more on a more chronic uh, dose of a metoprolol or a calcium channel blocker. Um, like deltiazem or verapamil, that may help them to prevent them from going back into the atrial arrhythmia. Okay, so getting back to the tamponade, uh, we're going to, the main finding here is this low voltage. So what, are, what do you wanna do next? So when you have this triad of the enlarged cardiac silhouette, the low voltage, the distended neck veins, hypotension, and tachycardia, you wanna get uh, an ultrasound and take a look at the heart. And what you can see here is here's the heart and all this fluid around here is a large pericardial effusion. And this is in a four chamber view, again, large effusion. And the big finding here is actually you see that the right atrium is being pushed in or what we call right atrial invagination. And if I play this, you actually can see, so here the right atrium is coming in a lot and also the right ventricle is also being collapsed. In addition, you can see that the heart is swinging around in this large effusion. Uh, so in this case, uh, that is going on some place too. This is something that we're going to need to do something about um, urgently. This is just another view of the collapse of the RV. The other uh, view that you can look at is looking at the IVC. So again, because it's going to be hard for blood to drain into the right atrium because of all this external pressure on the right atrium, your IVC will be dilated. And so that is also another hallmark of tamponade. If you see a small compressed IVC, that usually is a sign that there's not true tamponade. There still might be a large effusion, but it's not hemodynamically stable. So why does tamponade happen? And uh, tamponade is about the interdependence between the right and left ventricle. So normally the pressure inside the chambers exceeds the pressure that's inside the pericardial space. When you have a lot of fluid here and the pressure in here builds up, 
what happens now is that as the right ventricle is filling during diastole, the septum, which normally goes with the left ventricle, gets pushed over into the left ventricle. And uh, essentially, when these pressures get to be too much, you are not going to have filling of the heart. And if you don't have filling on the right side of the heart, you're also not going to get filling on the left side of the heart. And it's essentially a form of obstructive shock. So how do we treat tamponade? Again, we want to have IV access. You do want to give some IV fluids because we want to try and um, increase the intracavitary pressure inside the right side of the heart. You may need pressors, and then you want to consult a cardiology or a cardiothoracic surgeon. And typically, this is going to require a pericardiocentesis or a pericardial window. So there's a couple different ways you can get into the pericardial space. The most common is under ultrasound guidance. You're going to go sub xiphoid and you guide the needle into the pericardial space here. You need to make sure that you'll have enough distance um, to safely not perforate the right ventricle. Um, sometimes we actually take a lateral approach and you go in between the ribs and you can approach the effusion this way. And when the surgeons do it, they make a sub xiphoid incision and they get into the pericardium this way as well. Um, you know, sometimes when patients have malignancies and the pericardium actually is studded with metastases or tumor, uh, you can actually have loculations and it may be more difficult to get at just with a needle alone. All right. And then my final topic is going to be cardiogenic shock. And um, I think many of you know that uh, I participate in the shock team here at Cornell. And so this is, this is something that I'm very interested in and love talking about. But, um, you know, cardiogenic shock is really the state of end organ hypoperfusion that's due to cardiac failure. And it's really an important entity to recognize because the in-hospital mortality for this is quite high. There's many different causes. Some of these things we've already mentioned during this presentation. Um, other things that we haven't touched on really are valvular diseases, postpartum cardiomyopathy. And then um, for patients that are getting traditional cardiac surgery, sometimes they develop postcardiotomy syndrome. Okay, let me hop back to this question uh, here regarding tamponade. If it's a chronic effusion not causing hemodynamic compromise, can you trial LASIK safely, or will the intravascular depletion and RV collapse be too immediate compared to pericardial pressures decreasing? This is a great question. So a lot of patients live with chronic effusions, um, and whether that is from their underlying cancer, uh, it's very common in autoimmune disease patients, so specifically people who have like scleroderma or lupus, they may have a chronic effusion. And the short answer is, that as long as you don't see the features that are worrisome for tamponade or early tamponade echocardiogram and your patient is not tachycardic, not hypotensive, then you can give safe, you, say, you can safely give Lasix. Um, what you worry about is that you, you know, can decrease the intra right atrial pressures too much. But remember, that oftentimes, if this is a chronic effusion, patients have accommodated to this. Um, and so really the way to help guide you is besides for the clinical assessment is to get an echocardiogram. And you, know, you can also ask your, one of your echo, um, the echo interpreter to really look for any early signs of, of hemodynamic changes. But the short answer is, Yes, we can use Lasix, and yes, sometimes we have to use Lasix um, to bring down the uh, intracardiac pressures. Okay, so, all right. So the most important thing that you know, I want you guys to take away with when we talk about cardiogenic shock is that we really want to recognize patients early in their disease course. And the reason for that is that once patients have been in shock for a while, what happens is that they go into this inflammatory cascade that's induced by the systemic hypoperfusion. And once that inflammatory cascade has been sort of unleashed, it is very hard to rescue people, even with mechanical circulatory support. 
And um, so the goals here really are that we want to recognize this in a timely fashion. For those patients who have ischemic disease, we want to do coronary reperfusion. And the other two uh, pillars here are to do ventricular support, which actually means unloading the left ventricle with a, with a device typically, and doing circulatory support. And that means actually perfusing all the vital organs. So what's the general management here? So we want to provide adequate oxygenation. We wanna do hemodynamic monitoring. And what does that mean? Usually patients need intra-arterial blood pressure monitoring and they need a pulmonary artery catheter. And I know that um, you know, we're still trying to dispel the myths that swan GANS catheters don't help, but I can assure you that in cardiogenic shock, they do. And they do this for two reasons. There's one is it really does help to establish the diagnosis in patients with undifferentiated shock. And two, when you use swan GANS catheters appropriately, it really helps to guide your therapy decisions, whether that means just using medical therapies like these pharmacologic agents I listed here, or whether you're gonna to escalate to mechanical circulatory support, and that helps you really to decide what type of support you're going to use. When we think about shock, I think about these other disease entities, and here, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons from all of our colleagues. You guys in stroke very um, have a really good system where we even trained EMS out in the field to recognize stroke in patients bring them to a stroke center, rapidly identify them, call down the stroke team, assess patients for their time and therapies and get them that therapy they need. And this really has changed the face of the long-term morbidity and mortality. Same thing in sepsis, STEMI, and trauma. So why not in shock? And you know what we found is that uh, you know, different groups through the U.S. started trialing using shock teams, similar to STEMI teams and stroke teams, where you have a multidisciplinary approach to take care of the patient, recognize that they're in shock early, and focus on this time to therapy. And instead of just concentrating on door to balloon time, for instance, in patients with acute myocardial infarction, really talk about doing door to support time, support meaning mechanical circulatory support. And this is the one thing that has made a difference in terms of overall survival. So here at Cornell, we have a shock team. Uh, you guys may have seen some of these placards around, but think about cardiogenic shock. Anytime your patient has any kind of form of cardiac dysfunction, they have organ failure, they're not responding to fluids and they're requiring vasoactive agents. Through EPIC, and I'll show you guys how to, you can consult the shock team. We have a 24 seven CCU fellow in house. And so they can come and evaluate the patient at the bedside. And then through, uh, there are four attendings on call 24 seven from these different disciplines. And we get together uh, either in person or on the phone to help make the next decisions for the team, whether that means for the patient, whether that means going to the cath lab or activating our ECMO team. It's really simple in, uh, in EPIC. You basically type in consult shock. It will bring up this inpatient consult to cardiology. You put in your callback number, press sign. It will automatically send a message to the whole team. We have many different types of acute mechanical circulatory support that we can use for the patients. And so the decisions for these are made based on the numbers from the swan dance catheter and the um, degree of shock that the patient's in. And um, for those uh, at Sloan Kettering, I should have uh, included in the slide here that the, the first phone call should be to the transfer center. We'll tell them I need to be connected to the to the shock team at Cornell, and actually they will connect you to uh, the four attendings that are on call uh, through the transfer center, and we can help make a decision whether to bring the patient over emergently or whether um, we have had some instances where our surgeons have gone and cannulated patients for ECMO at Sloan and then brought them over. If your patient's not really quite in cardiogenic shock but has decompensated heart failure, um, on the InfoNet and on the NYP protocols app, there are uh, new inpatient management guidelines that you can find. 
And I'm not going to dwell on these here, but essentially they help guide you with how to diarrhea patients. There's a nice equivalency table here and what goals you want to use to uh, get fluid out of patients and decongest them. Um, there's some guidance here on what type of workup these patients need, what when to, cardi when to consult cardiology versus the advanced heart failure team. Uh, there's a, a whole section on guideline directed medical therapy for patients with heart failure with reduced EF. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of guideline directed therapy for HEF PEF for heart failure with preserved P uh, EF, so that section is short. And then there's a table with all of the uh, vasoactive drips we typically use for heart failure. Um, this is more for the medicine teams, and then what types of things we do for discharge planning. So uh, to wrap up, since I think it's three o'clock now, you know, I hope that this um, discussion helps you to have some type of algorithm for your approach to the patient with a cardiac emergency. Just remember, stick to your basics, get the EKG, that chest X-ray, some labs, and an ultrasound probe. It is important to know some basic EKG interpretation. Um, you know, review some of the algorithms so that you have some comfort when it does come to a true emergency. And then remember, we here in cardiology are always here to help you. I think that's 